In Exodus chapter 31, verse 17, scripture tells us that God rested on the seventh day of creation and was refreshed. Resting and refreshing. These aren't words that we would normally expect to describe the actions of an all-powerful God. And some people might look at verse 17 and think, maybe God has limitations or maybe at least at times God isn't fully God. In today's lesson, we are studying the concept of the Sabbath. We're going to learn what does it mean that God exemplified resting for us as the New Testament believers. This is a highly debated topic and certainly very controversial. So I encourage you, grab your pens, grab your papers. Let's get into the word of God. We've got an amazing lesson on our hands. As always, let's see what God has for us. want to take this time and welcome you to this episode of Just Teach. If you're new to the channel, welcome. Um, We believe in studying the Word of God around here and uh, certainly get comfortable, make yourself at home. Uh, If you have any questions, any prayer requests, the comment section is for you. By all means, utilize that. Uh, Certainly asking everyone to like, to share, uh, and certainly subscribe to the channel. If you haven't already, all of those things go such a long way in helping us spread the word of God all around the world. So certainly appreciate you for your prayers and support. In today's lesson, we are talking about obedience in rest. We are continuing in the fall quarter of the Union Gospel Press Sunday School book. I don't know about you. I've been having an amazing time uh, just dealing with this this theme of learning to honor God. We, we have been discussing just the many different ways that we can learn to honor God, but it all hinges on the posture of obedience. Everything that we do, is it is hallmarked with the idea that we are obeying God and that through obedience, we are honoring God because certainly scripture does tell us that obedience is better than sacrifice. So in today's lesson, we are tackling a a juggernaut of a concept. uh, And and I'm excited to talk about this. Um, I actually had gotten a request to make a video specifically about the Sabbath uh, a few weeks ago when we were studying um, Exodus chapter 40. And, And Moses and the children of Israel building the tabernacle, I had mentioned then some concepts around the Sabbath uh, and somebody made a request and said, hey, can you do a follow up video uh, going into more detail about the Sabbath? So I, 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 I want to let you know I did not miss the comment or the request, but I knew this lesson was coming up. And today we are doing just that. We are going to do a whole lesson dedicated to the concept of the Sabbath. So uh, so before we get into that, because our lesson is in Exodus chapter 31, I always like to lay a really good foundation and maybe give a little bit of background so that we know how we got to this place in Exodus 31. So if you go back to Exodus 12, we had a lesson about that a few months ago when we were talking about uh, the Passover feast. So we know with Exodus 12 is when God sent the 10th plague and that God killed all the firstborn uh, males in uh, in Egypt for those that did not have their doorpost marked with the blood. And that did prompt the release of Israel from Egyptian slavery. So then Exodus chapter 13 to Exodus chapter 19 is them beginning to wander in the wilderness. It is them traveling from Egypt and they eventually make their way to the Sinai Peninsula, which is the Midian territory where Moses had spent 40 years in the house of Jesse. So now that they've made their way to, I guess, familiar territory for Moses and they're in the Sinai Peninsula just uh, in front of Mount Sinai, they make a, a very pivotal pivotal uh, encampment there. And that is when God begins to speak to Moses and speak to the children of Israel and start giving out his law. So then in Exodus 19, they go through the sanctification and the washing of the preparation to go into covenant relationship with God. In Exodus 20, we get the 10 commandments and the Decalogue. And then Exodus 21 through 24, we get all the details, more details around the Mosaic law and different things that God wants them to observe and to do. 
And then uh, Exodus 25 through 30 is when God starts to give very detailed instructions around building and constructing the tabernacle. And then God talks about the selection of priests and how they were to adorn themselves. And God gives instructions around different sacrifices that Israel was to perform. So God gives very uh, detailed instructions on how they were to enter into relationship with him, how they were to operate as a people. Um, but then God immediately pivots from that conversation to Exodus 31, where God begins to talk to them about observing the Sabbath. Now, we're already learning something here because God had already told them in Exodus 20 on the fourth commandment is to remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. But here God is repeating himself in Exodus 31, telling them to observe the Sabbath. Why is God doing that? Well, God knew that in their effort of building the tabernacle and doing a work for the Lord that some people might be tempted to, to push past the Sabbath and to continue to work. You know, sometimes you can be zealous about doing a work for God. You can be excited about doing a work for God and that might tempt them to not rest, to, uh, to, to not observe the Sabbath. So God was reminding them, he says, in your efforts to build the tabernacle, please rest. You know, and that that is something that even we as New Testament believers can learn from because the work of God is important. It is very essential to the spread of the gospel for people getting saved and for the growth of the kingdom. Like we, we have to do a work for the Lord in order for the work to get done. But we can't allow the work of the Lord to keep us from resting in God or taking the time to engage in corporate worship, taking the time to pray and, and just really allowing God to rejuvenate you, not only mentally, but spiritually. You know, there's a very popular passage uh, of scripture where it talks about during Jesus's ministry that he traveled to the city of Bethany and he visited some, some very close friends of his, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Scripture talks about how Martha was in the kitchen working, making preparations for Jesus, and that Mary was just sitting at Jesus' feet. Well, Martha got upset and told Jesus, he was like, why are you sitting there let, letting Mary just sit at your feet when I'm doing all of this work? And God said that Mary has chose the good part. In other words, he, she, she chose to sit at his feet and to learn of him. And that's what we all have to understand. You know, uh, even as New Testament believers, as we go into this concept of the Sabbath, is that we, that is us taking the time to sit at Jesus' feet, to pull away even sometimes from church work and to just allowing God to refresh us and to speak to our hearts and give us things that only he can give to us in that moment. So amen, that's, that's, that's an important concept that we're already learning off the top. So I uh, want to point out a few things about the Sabbath because this is something because we're in Exodus 31 and we're talking about the instructions that God gave Israel regarding the Sabbath that as New Testament believers, this this can confuse some things. So I, I want to. Uh, uh, I want to lay out some very clear information for us as New Testament believers as it relates to the Sabbath, because uh, they tell you that our attention spans <laughs> in 2022 can be short at times and that they, you want to get your important information out in the beginning. So let's let's do this from the beginning. The first thing I want you to know about the Sabbath is that Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. So that means that any instructions or any examples that God demonstrated, uh, that Jesus demonstrated during his ministry, that is lending to us as New Testament believers on how we are to approach the Sabbath. What am I talking about? Well, in Matthew chapter 12, it talks about how Jesus and the disciples were walking through a field and were hungry and they picked up some corn and began to eat it. Well, according to Mosaic law, that was a violation. And some, you know, some Pharisees went to Jesus and said, aren't you doing that which is unlawful? And Jesus's response to them was that, uh, isn't it right, you know, for us as, first of all, he said in verse number eight, he says, the son of man is Lord even of the Sabbath. So, so Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. But then he said in verse number 12, that, uh, it, that it is okay to do well on the Sabbath. So when Jesus is saying that it's okay to do well on the Sabbath, he's saying it's okay to do that which is honorable, 
that which is noble, uh, that which is without blame. So in other words, Jesus was saying it's not wrong for them to do what is right on the Sabbath. Now, this is this concept is is further demonstrated because Jesus performed miracles and did different things to bless people on the Sabbath and, and healed people and just different acts of love. And even in that, the Pharisees would try to come to Jesus and after somebody would get healed and they pick up their bed and they were like, isn't carrying your bed, you know, a, a violation of the Mosaic law. And Jesus is repeating them, repeating himself and saying that it's okay to do well on the Sabbath. So this is already showing us as New Testament believers that the, the Jewish approach to the Sabbath would be very different for the Christians. It would be very different for the New Testament believers in that they they they, they observed a very uh, stringent, a very outward expression of the Sabbath. But what we're going to get into later on in this lesson that we're going to understand for the New Testament believer is that the Sabbath is something that we certainly demonstrate and certainly celebrate on a spiritual plane. So wanted to point that out is that Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath and that it's okay to do well. Um, also wanted to point out uh, why some Christians celebrate Sabbath on Sunday. Amen. Now, make no mistake. The Sabbath day is the seventh day of the week. Scripture says that six days God worked and then on the seventh day God rested. So the Sabbath day is the seventh day. But as New Testament believers, many Christians, uh, churches celebrate uh, or, or go to church on Sunday. Well, why is that? Well, because Jesus rose on a Sunday. Sunday is resurrection day. In Mark chapter 16, verse 9, it says, Now, when Jesus was risen early from the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast out seven devils. So Jesus rose on the first day of the week, first day of week being Sunday. So then scripture goes on to say in Acts chapter 20, verse seven, it says, and upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to part on the morrow and continued uh, his speech until midnight. So this is saying on the first day of the week that Paul taught to them and that was a gathering day for them. So that became that that was this is one of the examples that. Uh, the, the early church, the early Christian church would gather on the first day of the week. And that's why we gather as New Testament believers on Sunday, because this is something that was exemplified uh, in the early church. So then scripture goes on to say in Colossians chapter two, verse 16, it says, let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or uh, in respect of a holy day uh, or in the new moon or on Sabbath days. So this is Paul uh, letting us know that, uh, and this is something that Paul did pretty pretty consistent through, throughout his, his ministry, um, is that a lot of the Jewish ordinances that did not lead to faith in Jesus Christ, they were just outward expressions of religiosity. Paul said, like, don't let any man hold you in contempt or judge you for not literally observing a Sabbath day. Amen. Now, again, <laughs> if you're like me, you know, you attend a church that has service on Saturday and Sunday. A lot of churches out there do. A lot of churches have church on Saturday night and then they have church on Sunday morning. So you, you, you a lot of times you have the opportunity to, to, to do both. But realize this as we're talking about the Sabbath. Yes, the Sabbath day literally is the seventh day of the week. And most Christian churches do uh, fellowship on on Sunday, but that is tied to the fact that Jesus rose on Sunday. So wanted to just put, I wanted to offer that to somebody um, because d certainly want to do everything we can to just dismiss and dispel any confusion. But with that, let's get into today's lesson. Let's get into Exodus chapter 31 and let's begin with verses 12 and 13. And the Lord spake unto Moses saying, speak thou also unto the children of Israel saying, Verily my Sabbaths ye shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that ye may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. So with verse number 13, we have our key verse of this lesson. So a lot of good uh, detail and a lot of very critical information we're going to kind of extrapolate from this verse. So starting off, it says, Verily my Sabbaths 
shall ye keep. Now, if you're observant, you'll notice that the word Sabbath there is plural. And that certainly does indicate that there were different types of Sabbaths that God had instructed Israel to keep. Now, we're going to talk about four of them just briefly so that we have a good understanding of what God meant by Sabbaths, plural. So number one, the most common Sabbath that we're aware of is the Sabbath day, the seventh day of the week. So they were to rest and observe the Sabbath day on a weekly basis. Then there were several Sabbaths that God instructed Israel to observe as it relates to the different feasts throughout the throughout the year. Uh, we had discussed uh, two weeks ago the, the Feast of Tabernacles, and we discussed how the Feast of Tabernacles technically was an eight day celebration. But on the first and the eighth day was a holy convocation and that those were considered Sabbath days. So even inside of some of their um, some of their festivals. They observe different Sabbaths uh, as it relates to that. And that was in addition to the weekly Sabbath of observing the Sabbath on the seventh day of the week. Now, we understand that sometimes that meant that they would be observing, you know, a Sabbath maybe three times within an eight day period, because we understand that, uh, you know, that Sabbath, as far as Feast of Tabernacles goes, that all uh, relates to the calendar. It didn't necessarily relate to a specific day of the week. So they started observing the uh, the Feast of Tabernacles on the on the 15th day of the seventh month so there you go um so there was a lot of sabbaths going on just in relation to that third type of sabbath i want to meant to you i want to mention to you was a land sabbath so scripture talks about that uh israel had like a seven year cycle and on that seventh year it would be considered a land sabbath in which they would not plant or harvest any crops in leviticus chapter 25 verse 2 it says speak unto the children of israel and say unto them when ye come into the land which i give you then shall the land keep a sabbath unto the lord in other words he's saying for six years you'll sow and reap a harvest but on the seventh year you will allow the land to rest you allow the land land to sabbath and you won't sow anything Exodus chapter 23, verse 10, it says in six years, thou shalt sow the, thy land and shall gather in the fruits thereof. But in the seventh year, thou shalt let it rest and lie still. Now get this. There, there's, there's a concept in this. It says that the poor of thy people may eat and what they leave, the beasts of the field shall eat. In like manner, thou shalt deal with thy vineyard and with thy olive yard. So in other words, God is saying that on the seventh year, even though they don't sow seed, some harvest can just naturally grow. You know, some harvest that maybe didn't get reaped will get sown into the ground and it'll end up growing. And he's saying that the poor can come and take that and that can provide sustenance to them. Listen, God is... God is introducing not only a spiritual, but a very natural concept, you know, because it's showing him them that you, even nature needs to rest sometimes, even the ground needs to rest sometime. And I'm sure if you would talk to any farmers today, they would tell you that constantly, you know, sowing and reaping on farmland is unhealthy for it. Sometimes you need to let farmland rest. It's 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 almost like having a, a, a responsibility towards the farmland and doing what's in the best interest of the farmland. So this is a natural concept as well as a spiritual concept. And then there's a there's a there's a uh, fringe benefit to it in that the poor get to reap whatever is is uh subsequently uh grown uh, even by happenstance so you've got that third type of sabbath and then there's a fifth there's a fourth sabbath excuse me that was on the 50th year called the year of jubilee so you had uh, uh seven cycles of seven years so on the seventh year of a one cycle would be a, a land sabbath but then after you would do that seven times that 50th year would be again another uh sabbath a whole year of sabbath this referred to as a year of jubilee most people are, are familiar with this because um if you had any debts that were owed uh or if you had any loans that were owed or anything like that all of that would be forgiven and it would be released in the year of jubilee uh, in Leviticus chapter 25, verse 8, it says, And thou shalt number seven Sabbaths of years unto thee, even seven, uh, seven times seven years, 
in the space of the seventh Sabbath of years shall it be unto thee 49 years. So that's the seven cycles, if that if that doesn't make sense. Um, and then verse number nine, it says, then thou shalt cause the trumpet of the Jubilee to sound on the 10th day of the seventh month. In the day of atonement, thou shalt make a trumpet sound throughout all the land. Here's, here it is. In verse number 10, it says, and ye shall hollow the 50th year. So this is saying the 50th after the seven years of seven cycles. It says, and proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. It shall be a jubilee unto you, and ye shall return every man unto his possessions, and ye shall return every man unto his family. So it's saying return possessions. It says if anybody has any loans, or maybe they put up some piece of property as, uh, as bond or as surety uh, to secure a loan, they say give it back to them when it says return every man to his family you know jews had a concept that people could sell themselves into slavery if they had a debt that was owed they can work it off and they could become like a bond servant but uh in the year of jubilee if someone owed a debt and they put themselves as bond servants that um that they that they could be released you know they could be released they they the master had to release them, but if the slave chose to remain a slave, well, then they could do that. Uh, there's some very interesting scriptures around that uh, where it says that if, if a slave wanted to remain a slave, it says that they put a yule in their ear, which means they put an earring in their ear as a sign that they wanted to remain a slave. Yes. Um, so if people want to know where did the history of earrings come from, where it came from scripture and it was a sign that you wanted to be a slave, let that marinate. So, um, and, uh, another controversial topic, just, you know, food for thought, you know, because people always talk about is slavery in the Bible. Well, the slavery that's being described here is much different than some of the slavery that we see seen throughout modern history. Uh, these were people that were choosing to go into slavery and scripture even, uh, gave instruction on how slaves to be, be treated. If you read back like in Exodus, I believe it's either Exodus 21 or Exodus 22, where it talks about that if you were to be abusive to a slave, that uh, there was punishment for the slave master. You couldn't just treat a slave any kind of way. So this is very different than uh, than what some people try to make it out to be. But yeah, so there, there you have it. There are four different Sabbaths there. Uh, that's why the word Sabbath was plural in Exodus 31 and 13. But then scripture goes on to say something. Uh, it says, for it is a sign. Verily my Sabbath ye shall keep, for it is a sign. Now, it's, it's beneficial to know what signs are in scripture because this is a concept that we see repeated throughout scripture scripture talks about how in genesis chapter one that light is a sign it talks about how circumcision was a sign that you were in covenant with god it talks about how the rainbow was a sign you know of the of the promise that god made to the world um there's all different types of signs that are talked about even jesus jesus the christ is a sign that was prophesied in, in Isaiah. So it talks about, but what is what does a sign mean? Well, there's four different things that a sign can mean. Let's go through them quickly. Number one, a sign can be a military sign to just show uh, what army you're a part of. Very common, very obvious. A sign also, number two, can lend evidence of an event that took place in a past. You know, a very common sign that we have today of past events are memorials. You might see a statue of, of an army general, or you might see the, uh, the Pearl Harbor Memorial. You might see the memorial for the Twin Towers in New York City. Well, these are signs of a past event, okay? Then a third type of sign you might have uh, is a sign of future events or something that is prophesied that has not yet to come to pass scripture talks about that different signs that we would see in the last days it talks about how men would be lovers of themselves and that uh and that in the last days that that people will become resistant to sound doctrine and that would heap unto themselves their own preachers all these different things roars and rumors of wars are all evidence and signs of things that are to come then there's a fourth sign and that's what we're dealing with in today's text, a fourth type of sign, it is something that is tangible that gives evidence to an otherwise invisible concept. OK, what is the invisible concept? Covenant. OK, you can't literally see a covenant, but a sign lives evidence to that covenant. So uh, in modern day terms, you have a husband and wife. 
they are in covenant with each other, but you can't see the covenant. So what is a sign of it? Well, you've got a wedding band. It, it, it is something natural that gives evidence of something that is invisible. Um, another example of that, of course, again, is the rainbow. God made a promise to humanity, to the world that he would not flood the earth. And as a sign, OK, God gave the rainbow uh, another very important sign and a very blessed sign actually is the Holy Spirit. Amen. Yeah. In, in Ephesians chapter one, verse 14, it says that the Holy Spirit is the earnest of our inheritance. It is the down payments of what we are to receive in glory. Amen. I wish I had time to talk about that. But the Holy Spirit is a sign of, of God's promise to us as believers that we have an inheritance in heaven. Amen. The Holy Spirit is what is amazing. <laughs> Holy Spirit is our comforter. The Holy Spirit is our advocate. It is it is our power. Scripture says that God will reveal all things to us through the spirit. I mean, and then on top of all that, it is our earnest. Well, then finally, in today's lesson, it's saying that the Sabbath is a sign. It, it is evidence of the covenant between God and Israel. So it, it is very important that you understand what scripture is talking about when it's saying that the Sabbath, it, it is it is a sign Now understand this circumcision may be a sign of an individual relationship with God, but Sabbath would have been a sign of God's corporate relationship. And that's what's amazing. And that's that also lends to the idea of the assembling of believers together uh, to to give evidence of this covenant that exists between them and God. It's it was a Sabbath and it was a sign of God's relationship with all of Israel. So lots, lots of things to glean from the idea that the that the uh, the Sabbath is a sign between God and. Uh, and then we're going to get into it later, what it means throughout all the generations. We'll get to that uh, 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 later on in verse 16. Last thing I want to point out in verse number 13, trying to keep this short, uh, is that it says that it doth sanctify you. It says that ye may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. So it's understanding that recognizing Sabbath, practicing Sabbath, get this, is an act of sanctification. Got to understand that. Sanctification set apart, set apart for the use of God. So when you Sabbath, you set aside a day that is for God. You consecrate it. You make it holy. You know, I was, <laughs> listen, I was talking to the children in, in children's church and I asked them, you know, what is something that you do uh, on the first day of school? you know, in preparation for the first day of school. And I asked them specifically as it relates to clothes. And a lot of them said some really remarkable things. They said, like, when I get a new pair of shoes, I have my old shoes over here in the closet. And then I put a shoe box and then I, in between my, my old shoes and my new shoes, because they said, I don't want my new shoes to touch my old shoes. Some of them said, like, I iron my clothes and I set them out on the bed next to me because I, I I know that these are my new clothes for the new school year. And then some people talk about how they had their new clothes in a, in a special section of their closet. They, they, they separated. And what I was trying to explain to them is the same concept I'm giving to you that anytime you sanctify something, you separate it, you identify it as something that is clean, as something that is prepared, as something that is holy. And it's got a specific intent. Well, that's the same thing that the Sabbath is. You treat the Sabbath differently, just like these kids are treating their, their new school clothes differently. And that's it's so important that we as believers, because this is a demonstration of so many things in our walk with God. But what it does show is that we as believers have boundaries. One of the first practices as a new convert that you can establish holiness in your life is to consecrate a day of worship is to Sabbath. Understand that this is going to this is going to bleed into other areas of your walk with God because you'll start to set boundaries in other areas to say, maybe I won't listen to secular music or, or certain things that you wear or certain places that you go. You will learn how to sanctify areas in your life and consecrate it and say that this is exclusive to God. Scripture says that if you walk in the spirit, you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Well, that is something that you do over time, sanctification, learning to honor God. These are all things that you do. But one of the initial steps is Sabbath. 
sanctify it. Because please understand this, when you glorify God through something like a Sabbath, when you set it apart, understand scripture says that when you draw nigh unto God, listen, God's going to draw nigh unto you. You are literally inviting God into more areas of your life. And please believe me, that would lead to the, to the greatest blessings of God. Jesus said, come unto me, all you that are burdened and heavy laden. He said, I will give you rest, rest in him. See, so many people, when they talk about coming to God, sometimes all they think about are natural blessings. Listen, I want peace of mind. I, I, I want to be able to sleep at night and not wake up worrying. I want to have a God that I can turn to when I'm in trouble, when I'm afraid, when I don't know what to do. I want to just delight in God, delight in his word. His scripture says, if you delight in him, he'll give you the desires of his heart. Seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things will be added. Amen. So it says sanctifying yourself in God has so many peripheral benefits, but the concept of that, it does begin with Sabbath. Ye shall keep the Sabbath, therefore, for it is holy unto you. Everyone that defileth it shall surely be put to death. For whosoever doeth any work therein, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Six days may work be done. But in the seventh is the Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord. Whosoever doeth any work in the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Now, in verses 14 and 15, we are reading and studying the penalty for violating the Sabbath. And the penalty was death. Yikes. That's right. Sabbath law is a capital punishment. So that's, that just shows how serious God was uh, about observing the Sabbath. Now understand, again, the Sabbath was a sign of their covenant with God. So then by, by breaking this uh, practice of the Sabbath, it was really like violating their covenant. It's like, it's like cheating on your spouse, you know? So there, there were certain uh, mosaic laws that resulted in capital punishment. Not all of them by any landslide, you know, uh, were um, punishable by death, but certain ones like idolatry, uh, ad adultery, um, certainly um, like homosexuality, bestiality, you know, uh, kidnapping somebody's child, you know, just there's all different types of, of laws that resulted in capital punishment. But it wasn't just like just broad sweeping, like anytime you violate the Mosaic law, immediately, boom, you got killed. It, like it was it was considered the most heinous of, of sins, you know, that resulted in, in death. So that again, that just shows how serious God is about observing Sabbath and how God wanted them to sanctify it and set it aside as as holy to, to him. You know, so um, what what the verse tells us in verse 14 is it tells us what qualifies as violating the sabbath and it says doing any work therein so i wanted to take the time and just point out a few places in scripture as to what scripture identifies as work so the first one i want to point out is exodus chapter 34 verse 21 where it shows us very clearly that work is defined as plowing and reaping in exodus 34 21 it says six days thou shalt work but on the seventh day thou shalt rest in earing time and in harvest, thou shalt rest. Uh, also, Exodus 35 and 3, kindling a fire, making a fire is work. Ye shall, uh, ye shall kindle no fire throughout your habitations upon the Sabbath day. You know, interesting enough, Orthodox Jews, even unto this day, do not turn on lights on the Sabbath day or don't light candles on the Sabbath day, they consider that as work. So usually on the day of preparation, as they're going into the Sabbath, they would light candles that would stay lit <laughs> through the whole day because they, because again, you know, turning on lights is considered work. Very, very interesting stuff. Um, Numbers chapter 15, verse 32, gathering wood is considered work. Numbers thir number 15, 32, it says, And while the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they found men that gathered sticks upon the Sabbath day. And that was considered a violation. Can't gather sticks. That's considered work. Then Amos chapter 8, verse 5 uh, trade, participating in trade and commerce in economic trade is considered work. 
selling things uh, to people is considered work on the Sabbath day. Amos 8 and 5, it says, saying, when will the new moon be gone that we may sell corn and the Sabbath? They're asking even when, when is the Sabbath going to be gone? It says that we may set forth wheat, making the ephah uh, small and the shekel great and falsifying the balances. To see, in other words, it's just simply saying that they were they were wanting the Sabbath to be gone so that they can do these things because uh, participating in them violated the Sabbath. Jeremiah seventeen and twenty one. Any burden, anything that's considered a burden, is considered a violation of the Sabbath. It says, "Thus saith the Lord: Take heed yourselves and bear no burden on the Sabbath, nor bring it in my gates of Jerusalem." So, th those are several examples right there that Scripture would identify as work. Now, understand that Jews had more than the Torah. You know, they they had a uh, an oral Torah in addition to the written Torah. Uh, so there were a lot of different edicts and a lot of different rules that were created by rabbis throughout the year that were specific to the Jews uh, and that they observed as violations of of the Sabbath and what did they considered work. And I'm certainly not the expert on that, but I've I've heard so many conversations about people discussing certain things that is considered a violation of the Sabbath. But what I what is clear, you know, is just that. The day of preparation, which would be the day before Sabbath, is the day that they would do uh, any work. So in modern terms, that they would wash clothes, run errands, you know, get the car washed, cook. They would cook the, on the on the day of preparation so that on the Sabbath day, they could authentically like do no work and to rest. So, again, this is this is the Jewish approach to observing the Sabbath. Any work that they did was considered a violation and it was punishable by death. Now, again, us as New Testament believers, Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath and he told us to do well on, on the Sabbath. So uh, it is important that we take time to set aside time, certainly a day, you know, to to abstain from labor so that we can authentically rest. You know, I just like to believe that just like it is beneficial for the land to take a Sabbath, it is beneficial for our human bodies to rest, take, take some time out. It not only benefits you spiritually, but it certainly benefits you naturally. I like to believe a lot of these, these mental health issues that some people are going through, they would not be experiencing them if they would take the time to rest. Because I want to say this as we make our way to, to, to verse 16, you know, practicing rest and, and Sabbath is an act of faith. Understand this, setting aside time, a day to where you go worship God and you just consecrate it and sanctify it to God and where you, you could go work a second job or work a side hustle to make more money. Understand this, you are demonstrating faith in God by saying, God, I prioritize you over money. First of all, you're saying money doesn't run my life. God does. Amen. And the second thing you're saying is that you're saying, God, you're more important than this because I would dare not, you know, cut you out of my life for the sake of making an extra dollar. That's that is a demonstration of faith. That is literally Matthew 6 and 33, seeking the free kingdom of God and his righteousness and just trusting that God will add things to your life. And can I say this to you? I want to say this for somebody because this is this is something that you have to learn as a believer. Not all blessings are for you and not all blessings are good blessings, you know. So the reality is, is if if I can't make it happen in my life by working the six days, then it's not for me. Amen. Some blessings can come up, become a burden if it's not for you. Amen. So I, I you, you really just have to learn to just be satisfied in what God has given you and just trust and know that as the psalmist says, God's going to make you glad. God is going to make you satisfied and give you peace that can only come but from authentically trusting him. Wherefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days, the Lord made heaven and earth. And on the seventh day, he rested and was refreshed. So in these verses, uh, specifically in verse 616, 
uh, God is instructing Israel that this is not a one time thing to observe the Sabbath, but that he wanted them to observe it throughout their generations. In verse 13, it says that the Sabbath is a sign between God and Israel throughout the generations. In other words, God was saying, I want you, I want your children, I want your children's children and your children's children's children. And I want this to be a perpetual thing throughout the generations. As a matter of fact, verse 16, he says that he wants it to be a perpetual covenant. Now, this is important because understand that God establishes repetitive acts like this, like the Sabbath and even the feast, because there is blessings tied to memory. There is there is faith tied to memory. And when people remember what either what God has done or in this incident, it's putting us in remembrance of who God is. Uh, the, the Sabbath certainly gives you an opportunity to reflect on the things that God has done. Those things build our faith. That is what is so critical for us having faith in God, our memory. Scripture says they're overcome by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, by, by you remembering the things that God has done for you. That's how you continue to walk in faith and stand strong in God. But not only that, by them practicing uh, uh, the Sabbath and sanctifying a day, they're teaching their children how to reverence God. Because understand as the generations go on, these children would have not had an Egyptian experience. They would have not had a slavery experience. They would not have had the experience of, of the 10th plague and the Passover and God, you know, blessing and guiding them through the wilderness. Like the only way that they can really understand who God was to this generation is by them adhering and keeping the practices of their forefathers. That, that is how they reverence the blessings of God because understand and this is what God wants for them to have faith in him. And how can they understand that except they practice different acts of sanctification like the Sabbath. So God wanted them to continue this so that there would be a memory of this throughout the generation and that it would teach the children how to consecrate God in their lives so that God can be their God as well. Now, verse number 17, this, this, this is my verse right here because it says that God rested on the seventh day and then it says that he was refreshed now the word sabbath or word rest there is sabbath we know this it means to cease it means to stop whatever you're doing whatever work you were doing whatever activities you were doing you cease from doing it you sabbath okay but then that word refresh there i want you to understand that word means to breathe that's what it literally means. It means to just inhale and exhale. So it so when it's saying that God was refreshed, this this is not this is not scripture saying that God was depleted of energy or that God was depleted of power and by him refreshing himself, he was rejuvenated and then, you know, got his power back within himself. No. Understand both of these words are speaking to the sensation to the cessation, blah. Of, of work. <laughs> I'm getting tongue tied there. So on one hand, resting in Sabbath is saying that you were working and now you stopped. But refreshed is not being attributed to what was being done in the past, but what is going on in the moment. Now, some of you might know somebody out there that uh, doesn't have a job, <laughs> but they sit at home on the couch breathing. Well, they're resting, but they're not Sabbath. They're, they're not ceasing from work. They don't have a job. They weren't working. So there's two different types of rest. There's a rest that says I stopped working. And then there's a rest that says I'm just breathing and I'm relaxing in the moment. So understand that's what God was doing in verse number 17. Now, you may have read in the lesson commentary, there's a very scholarly word out there called anthropomorphic, which simply means that these are human experiences that we use to kind of describe God. And understand this, human language is wholly inadequate in describing God. Amen. You know, another one of these words is when scripture says that God is a jealous God. You know, that's an anthropomorphic term. We're going to read in verse number 18 where it says that God wrote the Ten Commandments with the finger of God. We, we in our humanity, we try to uh, discern and we try to interpret God through, through human eyes. And that's the best that we can do. 
but understand that our limited uh, imagination, our limited vocabulary, our, our limited mental ability does not limit God. Please do not ever allow the, 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 the inabilities of our humanity to limit God's divinity. Amen. So this is our best attempt to say that God stopped working and then God on the seventh day simply just breathed in the moment God was refreshed. And he gave unto Moses when he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai, two tables of testimony, tables of stone written with the finger of God. Now, verse 18 is really a transition verse that kind of transitions the text from Exodus 31 to Exodus 32. Understand, Moses has been in Mount Sinai for 40 days and 40 nights at this point. That's kind of what's going on in the backdrop, and I didn't mention that in the beginning, but when Moses went into the mountain to receive the law from the Lord and God is giving him all these different instructions, God is spending a lot of time with Moses, and it's saying that in the culmination of God's conversation with with, with Moses, he wrote the the uh, the two tables of testimony, the, the Ten Commandments that he hewed out of the stone of the mountain, and that that in a sense was written with the with the with the finger of God and that Moses would then be taking these tables of testimony down to the children of Israel where they are encamping down at the foot of Mount Sinai. Now, if you're a Bible scholar, you know, Exodus 32 is a really important chapter because that's where we have the golden calf. So scripture talks about that Moses being in the in the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights caused them to lose faith. They, they thought maybe something had happened to Moses. They thought maybe Moses wasn't coming back. And they immediately began to lose faith after they had just gone through all this consecration in, in, um, in, in Exodus 19 and, and, and them hearing, you know, just the, the thunderings and the lightnings and seeing the smoke and seeing this awesome display of God. The human memory can be so short term, you know, and it seems like they just immediately forgot how dynamic and powerful God is. I mean, God had just delivered them from Egyptian slavery just four months prior. And here they are immediately building, you know, an, an idol to worship God. So uh, very dynamic passage of scripture because on one end we're getting the covenant and we're seeing an immediate violation of the covenant. But that's what we have in this lesson. Listen, uh, I want to say this as I, as I end today's lesson I see some of the other YouTube channels that do Sunday school. They provide their notes through Patreon. And I wanted to see if you guys are interested in the notes that I use for this lesson. I know a lot of people uh, maybe watch videos like these in preparation for teaching their own lessons. And I, I'd be happy if this is something of interest to, to provide the, the notes that I have. Uh, if, it'll, if it'll enhance your study, enhance your preparation. Look, scripture says that we are helpers one to another. So just leave a comment in the comment section. Let me know if that's something of interest to you. As always, I love you with the love of the Lord and I'm praying for you.